Hydrograph produces and develops graphene and graphene-based solutions for composites, coatings, lubricants, and energy storage. I'm Martin Gagel with Market Radius Research. We have CEO Kirsten Brewer, CEO of Hydrograph, joining us today. Please remember this is neither recommendation nor investment advice. We're here to learn about the company. Hydrograph uh, just announced a MOU with Khalifa University, and Kirsten is here to discuss the news and bring us up to date on recent happenings within the firm. Kirsten, thank you very much for joining us. Sure. So we're very happy to have announced this MOU. We have decided to partner with Khalifa University, and just as a bit of background through this Mubdabla fund that Khalifa is associated with, they have funded The Geek, where we are co-located, and that is the Graphene Engineering Innovation Center that's affiliated with Manchester University. And so now we are part of the two main um, ecosystems or hotspots for, for graphene and graphene-related research. With Khalifa, we are going to tackle joint application development and regional production of graphene to go for the lubricant market, concrete, and composites within the Middle East. So this is expanding our reach, additional customer outreach, and we're very excited to announce this relationship. What, what does this MOU consist of? Are you doing joint research and development on it? Is it more on business development? How are you collaborating? This is in the early stages, so it is our intention to move some of our graphene reactors to the Middle East to have regional production. We will also be collaborating along with some other companies that we'll be naming soon on the applications involving concrete, lubricants, and the rest. Um, I believe in the early stages, we're going to be looking at concrete. Um, I will share more as soon as it's publicly available, but we will be engaging in this research together. We will have a regulatory strategy here, and we also have some larger customers that they have already engaged with. So this is a very good uh, development for the company. Of course, these are longer sales cycles, so there is some time before we're really going to get this product to market or these products to market, but it is a positive sign. Excellent. And what is the relationship with Khalifa University? Is it uh, like a, a joint venture or revenue sharing, or are you are, are you paying them to help support your research? What what does an MOU with a university like this uh, mean? At this stage, it is still um, a little bit up in the air. We have agreed that we're going to partner, so. Right now, we haven't determined exactly if it's going to be a JV or if it's going to be another structure, but we are certain that we are going to work with them to get that regional production up and running. We will absolutely be doing joint research with Khalifa. So we've already been shipping graphene over. We're looking at these application areas. And I would say the stage we're in now is really what can we do to expedite commercialization? And that is, you know, with other partners. And I'm hesitant to say too much because there are so many other parties that are involved in this that I, I want to have that approval before we share everything. Um, but we're certainly still within the planning stages. It is moving quickly, which is very positive, And we do look forward to sharing more once it's available. All right. There have been changes within Hydrograph as well recently. Welcome and congratulations on your new role as a CEO of Hydrograph. Uh, can you please bring us up to speed on what does this mean for the company? Does this change strategy or execution? Or uh, what does your sort of new set of eyes bring to the company at the top leadership position at Hydrograph? Thank you for that. And good questions. Um, so Stuart has left the company just personal reasons. He has our full support in doing so. And um, just for a bit of background, I was the first employee of Hydrograph. I've been with the company um, going on my fifth year. So I do know this company very well, of course, a master's in material science and engineering. And really, I think that um, we've made good progress, but I think there are some things that we've just now implemented in the past few months that are really going to be a catalyst for this growth and towards our path to market. So I think the first things that we could touch on is, um, while I, I certainly believe in the co-locating model in certain instances, I think if it's um, potentially a DOD-related contract or a very large, stable customer that really needs to have that supply chain security, that can make sense. But to go back to our production method, we detonate hydrocarbon gases with oxygen and we get pristine graphene. When we think of the costs that are associated with that, 
we have a volatile gas, acetylene, that is very expensive to package and ship. It makes sense to me that we need to locate as close to the acetylene source as possible, and this can cut our costs drastically. So this is, in my mind, very good for the company because graphene is light, it's easy and you know very affordable to ship. Um, and again, you know, I think that we'll need production facilities in each continent. It's not that we'll just have one centralized facility, but having one centralized facility, I think is better, not only in terms of managing our IP, but we have controlled explosions that I don't think every customer would necessarily be comfortable with. I think that having that um, decentralized method really does add to CapEx. It adds lots of complications to cost management insurances. Um, it would be difficult, I think, to grow only with that method. So again, I don't want to be too critical of it. I think it makes sense in a lot of situations that we might come across, but I would like to reserve that for a must have rather than a let's have that as a blanket model. I think that the centralized facility is going to give us much better margins and much more control over how we're going to grow. And you're, I, I would think under that as well, if you have two customers that need the production of half a machine, then instead of installing two machines, you can run it off of one machine at your centralized place and get much more efficient production. And then I, I, however you control the mechanisms, having your professionals there turning knobs and dials to, to get exactly right and making sure the QC is on, on track uh, makes a lot of sense to me. And then when a client gets big enough where they need the full production and they've got their own expertise, then to move, roll it into their facility if and when it makes sense. And I would probably clarify, I mean, we would be talking a massive amount of machines that the customer yeah. would want to ever consider that method. And again, the costs would be higher for the customer. So I, in any situation, unless it's a very specific situation, I can't imagine the customer would actually want that. I think our ability to cut costs is going to be so significant that this new model um, is going to be better for everyone. And I would also maybe even point out that one of the most common misconceptions with this company is that investors you know, hear what we've been saying and communicating to the market as us being open to selling or licensing these units, which has never been the model. And I think that this new strategy kind of clarifies that we are a graphene production company. We will only ever be selling graphene. We will never be engaged with selling or licensing these units. And I think that maintaining that, um, you know, oversight on the IP and kind of that controls aspect of it is going to be better for the company. Makes sense. Are, are there any other approaches to how you're approaching the, the business development and the product development that are getting implemented as well? Yes. Um, I believe very strongly in a, in a big push towards application development, um, which I think should in a company like this always come before business development activities. And I think to fully discuss this, let's take a step back and just talk about commercializing a new product, especially an advanced material. Graphene, as much as it is this product or material that has all these superlatives, it is the strongest, the most conductive, it can do everything. We're really scratching the surface with the impact that graphene is going to have across every industry virtually. This is all very exciting, but with anything new and high tech and very cool, it takes time to not only learn what it can do, but to integrate it into every process. And I think that what um, we have needed to spend more attention is in generating these data sets. So every time we're looking at a new material, we need to have that solid use case internally. So then it's a different conversation where a BD person is, and I'm not suggesting that we've been doing this, but just to articulate my point is, hey, you should really use this material. You know, We don't know exactly what it's gonna do, but I think you should try it, spend all this money and I hope it works out for you. That's obviously not a very strong argument to be starting a conversation often. And I think that when you do have these really robust data sets, you can say, well, we have tried this internally in PET and polyethylene, polypropylene, we're getting double digit performance gains, the loading is very low. We've already run some you know, calculations on the economics of it. I think you're gonna break uh, or get to break even. 
that's a much stronger value proposition when we've already run the numbers, we already know what to expect in terms of the performance gain, and we can help walk that customer through that process and really you know, identify which features they're looking to exploit, whether it's you know, anti-corrosion or UV protection. We can add all this up and really come in from a much more calculated viewpoint and really assist them in fully commercializing it kind of um, more collaboratively than just selling it as an over the fence product. And I think that um, a lot of companies have struggled with this part and it takes time to generate these data sets. But once you have them, it is incredible the interest that you can receive once you do have that proof. And then I think to go back to you know our now partnership with the Geek, the Graphene Engineering Innovation Center out of Manchester University, it's a fantastic model because it is such a strong ecosystem as graphene was discovered there that there's you know a huge percentage of material scientists, chemists, physicists. They have all of the industrial prototyping machines, all of the characterization machines. And when we're there, you know, we have different projects. We have our hydrograph team, just to be clear. And then there's the geek staff and they have different departments that cover energy storage, composites, lubricants. And so when you're a customer, let's say you're a large um, customer, whether it's Rolls Royce looking at some um, improvement they could see with an engine part or someone else, you I think that because it's such a new industry, you need to have a model that is generating trust. And that's really what the geek has become because they're unbiased. Rolls Royce or another customer could go to them and say, we want to improve this engine component. What graphene should we use? And the geek, because they have access to everyone's data, you know, confidentially, they can say, based on what we've done, we think this company produces the right graphene for what you're looking for. Because we have such high purity, such a scalable, consistent process. And luckily, you don't need as much of our graphene as other graphene. So the loading is very low. That makes the price lower. And the loading is the amount of graphene added, which of course makes it more cost effective for the customer. We are performing very, very well in that model. And just in the past few months, we have begun um, to be engaged with many potentially very large customers and of course, uh, potentially large customer contracts. So I think that this is something that um, could have had more attention previously. And I think that now that we're really there and we have this new strategy, we're going to see, I would actually think or say that we will be able to announce something in the next few months, um, something that is well within 2024 showing the path. And I think really taking off in 2025, because of course, these are products that will be um, on the market for years. You know, there's lots of um, steps that you go through while you're commercializing a new product um, to give an automotive product as an example. You know, the work that we're doing now, we would be selling kilo amounts. We would upscale that to hundreds of kilos by the end of the year. The work would go on throughout 2025 and that new material would likely be in the car within 2026. So it is a longer process, but these are such huge scale that really I think what we need to be doing right now is painting that picture to the investor and explaining this is the path to market. This is where we're at. This is the phase that we're in with these customer negotiations once we're allowed to disclose that, of course. And I think we're going to see a big change in share price once we do have these initial proof points. And maybe it's not tonnage amounts, but it's a very clear path to market. And there are multiple customers that we're talking with now that are very, very large in scale each. So it's an exciting time and certainly a um, potential problem being how quickly can we upscale to uh, fulfill this demand and increased capacity, but one that um, is a very exciting moment for the company. Well, I, 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 this transition to the, the, the strategy, I guess, where you, you're going from a, a part or a, an ingredient supplier to mm -hmm. sort of a solutions solver where you say okay you've got a problem we've got a database of knowledge on how to use and apply graphene and we can work collaboratively with the, your clients which i think would help bring them on help keep them as stickier clients and um and, and just build stronger relationships there. and i guess the knowledge you get, get from one application you can learn from that and apply to other applications as well so it increases your maybe not patentable IP, but your general uh, IP 
and, and your knowledge of uh, of the use of the material. Exactly. And I mean, just to clarify a few things, you know, this data is relatively affordable to generate. It's not even close to hundreds of thousands. It's, let's say, 10,000 for each uh, material. And there's a huge range there, of course, because it depends on what application we're looking at. But for every data set that we generate, we're unlocking a huge part of the market. And we really only have to do this upfront work one time. And, you know, we're going to learn as we move forward with these different customers and the industry itself is going to be learning. So while it seems like a lot of work initially, like you mentioned, it is very sticky and we will be in these products for a very long time. And luckily with Hydrograph, you know, our purity and our performance is so strong. I do really believe that we have everything it takes to be that market leader. And once we have gone through these different iterations of different materials and engage with enough customers, it will kind of eventually take on a life of itself and start to propel itself. And it will become easier to integrate and to reach additional markets still. All right. Well, that's great. Kirsten, uh, we covered a lot of topics. Is there anything else you want to discuss before we wrap it up? No, I think that um, this has been a very nice conversation. I'll certainly reach out once we do feel that we have something else to disclose, but thank you for your time today. All right. Thanks a lot, Kirsten. Have a great day and we'll talk again soon.